Psalm 66, and we're going to kind of walk through it. And I want to start out with two verses that are kind of going to be the, the key to the whole thing. In Psalm 66, it's verse 5 and verse 16. And I'm using the New King James Version, not because it's more special than any other version. I just like it. So it may look a little different than New Living Translation, but it'll basically be the same. And these are the two key verses that kind of jumped out to me over and over again as I kept reading and studying this passage. And there's a difference in them. And we want to look at how do we get from one to the other. And the first is verse number five. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the son of men. Then verse 16. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Come and see and come and hear. What's the difference? And how do we get from here to here? Let's dive into Psalm 66 and take a look. Psalm 66 was most likely written by David, although it doesn't specifically say that in the Bible. There's nothing that would really give us reason to think he wasn't the author. It's consistent with his writing style. And, you know, there's nothing that would glaringly jump out and say, no, David wouldn't talk like this. So while it doesn't specifically say it, we can be pretty sure that he is the author. This psalm starts off like so many in verses 1 through 4, and it simply says, Make a joyful shout to God all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works, the greatness of your power. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name, Selah. Wow. Declaration right from the beginning. Shout to God. Make a joyful shout to God. We see this throughout the Psalms. We see this specifically in Psalm 100, verse 1. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. We see it in Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. The psalmist David, he calls for a shout. Not a meek, little, whispery, whimpery praise, but a joyful noise a loud voice. This is how we are to praise him for all the great things that he has done and simply because he is worthy. One thing I think we do right at Lighthouse, we do many things right, but one thing I think we do right, we do this right. We worship with a loud voice. There's no meek, shy little worship in Lighthouse. I love it. I love to come to church here. I love it because when whoever is leading, whether it's Brother Chris or Brother Stephen or Sister Panina, the moment they sing, it's like, Whoa! it's like this loud voice. And I think, too, it kind of helps that we have this nice low ceiling, so it just kind of amplifies and echoes. We do this well at Lighthouse. We shout unto God. We sing joyfully to him. It excites me. I love to see something in the scripture and then say, yep, we got that one right. But when we start moving into verses five through nine, the psalmist gives us an invitation. Come and see, let's read the verses. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing towards the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. He starts off this section saying, come and see. The Hebrew word that's translated see here means to look at, to inspect, to consider. And then he gives us two very specific things to consider. Did you, did you see him? He turned the sea into dry land and they went through the river on foot. He's specifically referencing here when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and when they crossed the Jordan River. Their deliverance out of Egyptian bondage 
and moving into the inheritance of the promised land. These are two of the most significant events in the history of God's people, deliverance and inheritance of a promise. It's a pattern that God still does for us today. He delivers us from sin, does he not? Yes, and he brings us to the inheritance of his promises, which for us, our promised land is heaven. Promised land is not Hong Kong. Promised land is not America. Promised land is not Europe. Promised land is heaven, and that's where we're headed. This is what God does for us. But there are many more examples of God's great works for us to see and consider and think about things that cause us praise. You know, today is Mother's Day, so often we think about Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter one. You remember the story of Hannah? Hannah had no children. She was desperate for a child. She cried and she cried and she prayed and she prayed, so much so that the priest thought she was drunk. But she said, no, 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 I'm praying, I'm desperate for a child. She was barren, she could not have children. God answered her prayer and gave her not only Samuel, we rejoice because we, we know Samuel, but when we read further, God gave her five more children. She had six children total, God gave her more than she ever asked for. God opened a barren womb. That's a reason to celebrate, that's a reason to rejoice. We think of a story from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 8 through 16. There we hear the story of another woman, the widow of Zarephath. This woman was desperate. There was a famine in the land. She had no food. In fact, when the prophet found her, he said, would you make me something? She said, I have no food. In fact, I'm going now to get some wood, some sticks. I'm gonna cook my last meal. My son and I are going to eat and then we're going to die. I mean, she's desperate and she's just blunt. I love blunt people. She didn't try and sugarcoat it. She said, I, I, I got nothing for you. But the prophet spoke through the voice of God and said, cook something for me first. And she did and God performed a miracle. As you read that passage, God provided food for her her son, her household, and the prophet for the entire time of the famine. God performed a miracle for her. He gave her something out of nothing. When we continue in second, into 2 second Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, we find another widow. Seems like I have lots of examples of women, but you know, today is Mother's Day, so. <laughs> But in 2 Kings, we come across another widow. We don't know her name. We don't even know exactly where she was from. But this widow was desperate. Of course, her husband was dead. Obviously, she's a widow. She was in great financial debt. She had two sons, and the creditors were coming. The debt was so great. The creditors are coming to take her two sons and take them away as slaves in order to pay off the debt. She's desperate, she has no money. Her only source of strength is getting ready to be taken from her. She asks the prophet, I don't know what to do. And the prophet speaks to her, God speaks to the prophet and he speaks to her. And do you remember the story? What do you have? I have a little bit of oil. Go borrow jars from all your neighbors and fill them up with oil. So she and her boys go out and get everybody's pot from the village and they start pouring oil and pouring oil and pouring oil. And the instruction was, now go sell it and take the money and pay off your debts. God took this little bitty bit of oil and made it multiply so that she could pay off her debts. Her sons were saved from slavery. God provided a financial miracle for this desperate, desperate woman. What about something a little more practical? Those just seem so big and so grand. God even does the practical things. Again, in 2 Kings, we see a story. They're going out to build some things. And one of the guys in the group, again, we don't know his name, he borrowed an ax from somebody. And as they're chopping down the trees, the iron ax head falls into the water. He's frantic, he's desperate, he borrowed it. Imagine you borrowed something of great value from a friend and you're using it and an honest accident happens and it's gone 
and you don't have the money to repay it. You can't find it. This young man asks the prophet, what do I do under the direction of the Lord? The prophet says, where did it fall? Throws a stick in the water. The iron ax head floats. God even takes care of the practical things in our lives. That's all good, Julie, but that's all Old Testament. What about New Testament? I'm glad you asked. We have plenty of examples also in the New Testament. Things for us to consider, great things that God has done. In the book of Mark, chapter 5, we have two examples in one passage. Mark, chapter 5, verses 12 through 43. We have the woman who had the disease, who had the issue of blood. 12 years she struggled with this disease. With this type of disease, she was not allowed to go to the temple because she could contaminate others. She couldn't be near family. She couldn't go anywhere. It wasn't just the disease. She lost everything. She lost all her money trying to see doctors. Nothing could help. But Jesus healed her in an instant and made her whole. She not only got her health back, she got to go back and be part of the community again. God did an amazing thing for this woman. In the very same passage, we see Jesus goes to the house of Jairus and heals Jairus' daughter, raises this little girl up. In fact, by the time Jesus got there, they said, she's dead, go away. He said, no, 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 she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And he spoke, and the little girl sat up, and she was healed and restored. Mark chapter 2 Jesus heals the paralyzed man that is brought in by the four friends. They cut the hole in the roof and let the man down. And Jesus healed this paralyzed man. That didn't happen in those days. Luke chapter 7, Jesus heals the this, this centurion's servant. The centurion, this Roman leader, comes and says, Jesus, please heal my servant. In fact, you don't even have to come. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, He's healed, go on your way. And the servant was healed. John chapter five, Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. This man had been laying there for over 30 years, waiting, just waiting, trying to get in the water. Jesus comes along and says, do you want to be healed? Yes, but someone always gets in before me. Yes, but do you want to be healed? And Jesus healed the man who was laying there. John chapter 9, Jesus heals the man born blind. This man had never seen anything in his life. And Jesus came along and healed him. These are such great stories to build our faith. We get to come and see them in God's word. These great things that God has done for his people in the past. Consider this list. We have deliverage from bondage. We have inheritance of promises. We have provision for food and daily survival. Provision for financial debts. Healing of a barren womb. Provision for practical needs. Healing of long-term illnesses. Healing of crippling illnesses and disease. And the book of John says in chapter 21, verse 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. God has done so many things for his people. There's such great examples for us to look at and see, wow, we have reason to praise the Lord. We have reason to be encouraged, to be strengthened by all of these great, great things that he's done. No wonder the psalmist can rejoice and say in verses 8 and 9, Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our foot to be moved. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that exciting? We could just stop right here and say, yes, my heart feels better. Let's go home. Let's be happy and go home. But if we did that, we, would, we wouldn't be telling the whole story. We need to see the whole story. We've seen now the part that says, come and see. But again, I asked a question at the beginning. How do we get from come and see to come and hear? You might not like the answer. 
The answer is found in the next couple of verses. Verses 10 through 12 and following take a more personal tone. It's the turn that moves us from that place of inspecting and considering to telling and declaring. That move comes through trials, trials and testing. <laughs> but wait, 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 wait. We've just heard all these great stories. God provides, God heals, God delivers. And now we have to talk about trials and testing. We're up here. Why do we have to go down here? It's, it seems as if we're going the opposite direction. But testing is a reality that we all face. We all face it. So let's take a look. Verses 10 through 12, the first half of verse 12. For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. What? Wait, God did these things? Yes. You did it. You did it. You did it. God allows us to go through testing and trials. This shouldn't be a surprise to us. We think of Job and the testing that he went through. Nothing, nothing happened to Job that God did not allow to happen. The enemy came and said, oh, well, Job praises you because, you know, you take care of him. But if you took away his things, he wouldn't praise you. Okay, take away his things. Well, if you took away his family, he wouldn't praise you. Okay, if you took away his health, he wouldn't praise you. Job lost everything. He lost his business. He lost his family. He lost his health. Think of Joseph. Joseph was separated from his family for 22 years. And for 13 of those years, where did he spend them? In the, in, as a slave and in the prison. Tests and trials are going to come our way. I, I've heard people say, and even recently somebody asked me, um, I, I thought if you were a Christian and if you were, you know, a really, really good Christian, bad things wouldn't happen to you. You know, that I, I heard somebody got a cancer, but she's a strong believer. Why did she get a cancer? Because tests and trials are going to come? But, but she's good. Job was good. Joseph was good, and tests and trials still come. The Bible tells us these things are going to come. Let's take a look at James. James chapter 1, verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into trials. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it is strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Isaiah 43, verse 2, and this is just parts of that verse. We'll look at the full thing in a minute. When you pass through the waters, when you walk through the fire, it's not a question of if. It is a matter of when. The Bible clearly tells us we will face trials. We will face them. I, I like that Jesus did not hide this from us, that God made it very clear in his word that trials are going to come. I shouldn't be surprised when they come. So you may ask the question, why? Why does a trial have to come? Why do I have to walk through this mess? They come to purify us. They come to teach us. They come to cleanse us. They come to bring us to maturity. They come to strengthen us. Some things we are never going to learn unless we walk through a trial. That's where we're going to learn them. There's an old saying that says, you will never know God is all you need until he is all you have until you reach that point where God is all that you have to cry out to, then you will truly understand he's all that you need. Um, you know, we, we said trials come to test, to strengthen us. Let's look at this a uh, little further into, the, into James. James 1, 
We looked at verse two, now let's look at three and four. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete, lacking nothing. And some translations say that you may be mature. Romans chapter five, verses three and four. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And Job 23.10, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. We have to grow up in the Lord. We have to develop patience. We have to develop perseverance and character and hope. Those things come through the trials that come to test us. Does anybody like a trial? No! <laughs> no, 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 no. And one of the big questions that we ask when a trial comes our way is, Lord, how, how long is this going to last? If I could tell you today, oh, Gigi, you're going to face a trial. It starts tomorrow. It ends on Friday. <laughs> okay, I know how long to prepare for this. Oh, you're going to face a trial, Keith, and it's going to last for 30 days. Okay, I can do it. I can do anything for 30 days. Problem is, God doesn't tell us in advance how long the trial is going to last. I wish he did. Then, you know, but you probably one of the reasons he don't he doesn't is because then I would rely on my own strength. I can do this. I can do anything for five days. I can do anything for 30 days. God doesn't tell us how long do the trials last until, until what? Until we have learned what we need to learn. Until he has purified us. Psalm 105, 19 says this of Joseph. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. In other words, until Joseph learned what he needed to learn, until he was purified, until he was refined. You remember his story? He was first in Potiphar's house, and that, you know, if you got to be a slave, okay, at least he's in Potiphar's house. It's not, you know, there are worse places to be a slave. Then he's falsely accused, and he's thrown into prison, and God blesses him in prison, and he rises through the ranks of the prisoners, and he's now in charge of all the prisoners. And you remember, he had an encounter with a baker and with a cupbearer. And he said, oh, they said, oh, we've had dreams and we're troubled and we don't know. So Joseph gives the interpretation. One of you is going to die. One of you is going to be restored to your position. And what did he say to the one who was restored to his position? Remember me. Please tell the king. Please tell the king I've been falsely accused. I don't belong here. Please, I, I don't belong here. Tell him. And what does scripture say? The man is restored to his position. Two more years go by. It's two full years before he remembers to tell the king. Obviously, Joseph wasn't finished being refined yet. Obviously, there were still some more things that needed to be worked out of his life. That the man waited two more years before he said anything to the king. Now, don't be discouraged. I'm not telling anyone your trial is going to last 13 years or you've seen a little glimpse and oh, that was a nice glimpse, now you got two more years. But just know this, the trial will last until God refines you, until he teaches you, until he polishes you. Sometimes I find myself when I recognize I'm in the midst of a trial or a test, Lord, please help me to learn what I need to learn. Help me to learn it fast. Help me to, you know, and maybe that's a, a, not the best prayer, but I, I find myself now in, in, in testing and trial saying, Lord, what is it you want to teach me? What is it that needs to be polished off? What is it that needs to be refined? But I have some good news for you. We go through trials, we go through tests, but look at Isaiah 43 verse two, the whole verse this time. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the fire scorch you. 
I will be with you. You are not walking through a test and a trial by yourself. We have the promise of the Father right here. I will be with you. I can go through a test and a trial knowing, having this promise, this assurance in my heart. He is with me. I'm not alone. He's right there beside me. But there's a second good thing about testing. Psalm 66, verse 12, the second half of the verse. But you brought us out to rich fulfillment. The test doesn't last forever. It does come to an end. And when God finishes the test, he brings you out to rich fulfillment. Or another translation says, you brought us out to abundance. Another word says, you brought us out to saturation. Think again of Joseph. When he was delivered from the prison, where did he go? He went to the palace. Think again of Job. He lost everything. God restored everything everything back to him. When you come out of the test, God restores. God brings you to a, an abundant place. Tests and trials are coming. God is with us in them, and he brings us out of them. So what happens after the test? What happens after the trial? Two things happen after the testing and the trial. The first we see in verses 13 through 15. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals. With a sweet aroma of rams, I will offer bulls with goats, Selah. Now it's 2017. We're not dragging bulls and goats into the sanctuary. It would be really noisy in here today and kind of smelly. But what we do in this day and age, what this means is we come into God's house and we give him our praise. We come and we offer him our worship. We offer him the sweet fragrance of our worship. After you have come through and you've been refined and you've been tested, it is time to worship God the Lord. It is time to praise him because as the beginning said, he preserved our life. You didn't die in the trial. You survived. You survived to abundance. It's time to worship him. It's time to praise him for the great things that he has done. What did you learn in that trial that you didn't know before? What was polished off of you? What rough edge did God say, you've had this, this uh, bitterness a little too long, we're going to take that off. You've had this hot temper a little too long, this trial is going to knock that out of you. What did you learn? What did God refine in you during that trial? It's time to worship him and praise him after the trial. The second thing we see is this in verses 16 through 20. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. Come and hear, and I'll tell you what he did for me. You know, we heard all of these great examples. God gave this woman a baby. God gave this woman finances. God gave this person food. God healed this man. But I don't know those people. I know you. I need to hear your story. When I hear your story, it's powerful. It's testimony. After God has done something for us, we need to tell what he's done for us. It becomes more real. And when you put the two together, what God has done for others and what he's done for us, it's like dynamite. It's like faith just explodes. We have to get from the place, move from the place of just saying, come and see all these wonderful stories that God did in the past, and those are good, and we need to know them. But then we have to, after the test and after the trial, we have to say, let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you just one thing that, that I can tell you about how God has provided food for me. When I was in university, 
I went through a phase where finances were tight. My parents lived far, far away on the opposite side of the country. And it was Monday, and I would not be paid until Friday. I was working a small little job at the university. I had $5 and a loaf of bread and like a box of cereal in the cupboard. And I thought, Lord, what am I going to do? It's five days till payday, I have $5. I mean, that won't even barely buy me a McDonald's Happy Meal. Lord, I trust you. My parents were so far away, they couldn't send me money. They, you know, it wouldn't get there in time. I watched that week, every day, either someone brought me food or said, hey, I'm going out, come let me treat you for five days until my money arrived. God took care of the widow, he took care of me. Let me tell you also, I've seen God provide finances for me. We saw God earlier took care of the widow who had no money. A couple of years ago, many of you know, I started having some trouble with my kidneys. I suddenly, without warning, ended up in the hospital. And I foolishly told the doctor, oh, I'll go to private hospital. I, with no insurance, said, I'll go private. And it was a panic moment. I didn't know what to do, so I, in panic, chose the private hospital. And I foolishly thought Hong Kong hospitals are like American hospitals. If you don't have enough money to pay the bill on the day you leave, you sign a promissory note and you say, I will pay you this much money each month until the bill is paid. Foolish me. It doesn't work like that in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to pay every dime on the day you're just discharged, or you're going to stay and, in, and have a bigger bill, or in the most extreme cases, they're going to take you to jail. I did not know this, and the day I went into the hospital, I, I asked the doctor, I said, um, how much will this be? Uh, you know, how much? And he said, well, I, I can't tell you for sure, we don't know how long you will stay, but maybe 60 to 70,000 Hong Kong dollars. I said, okay, and I didn't ask, oh, what's the payment plan? This was a good thing because everything would have stopped right there. I went into the hospital, I had a thousand Hong Kong dollars in my bank, and I just began to pray, and I, I didn't even have enough strength to pray for myself. My parents began to pray and others began to pray. I ended up in the hospital for one whole week. It was, and that's a whole nother story in itself. God healed my body while I was in the hospital. My, I had one kidney that was dead and one that was dying. The one that was dying came back to function as it should. It took longer, so I was there seven days. So I go to, they say, okay, they finally come and they say, all right, you can go home today. First, go down and see the cashier. So foolish me, <laughs> I go down there. Okay, she says, yes, your bill is $87,000. I said, okay, what's your payment plan? She said, use a credit card. <laughs> I don't have. Borrow a friend's credit card. My friends don't have that kind of money. I, I, <laughs> I said, can't I just give you a little bit each month? No, write a check. <laughs> the check will bounce. <laughs> I, and by this, at this point, I'm starting to panic. I thought, oh God, what do I do? What do I do? I don't have, eh, have $87,000. Eh. And I called Pastor Jennifer. Pastor Jennifer, can you talk to them? Can you? So she called and she talked to them. And in the meantime, I called my mother in the U.S. I said, Mom, they've, they're asking for $87,000, which is about $12,000 U.S. And, and I don't know what to do and I have to pay today or they're not going to let me go. And, and she said, Julie, this morning, all of your money arrived for your hospital stay. We will wire it today. You can pay the bill. I can tell you, just like the widow whose debts were paid off, I can tell you, God provides finances miraculously. $87,000 was given to the hospital that day. I didn't go to jail. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The point is this. What is your testimony? What have you been through that you need to share that someone can say, oh, I needed to hear that. It's good to hear these stories of people who lived thousands of years ago, but I don't know them. I know you. What is your story? What is your testimony? What is the trial that you're walking through that if you're walking through it, 
don't worry, it's not going to last forever. Don't worry, God is with you in the middle of it. Here are the things that I want us to take away from this today, the summary points. Number one, we need to praise God. He's worthy of praise. We start out with that in the very beginning of this psalm. God is worthy of praise. We need to praise him with a loud voice, with a shout, with a joyful praise. Number two, come and see, consider, look at, inspect all of the things that God has done for his people in the past. And we went through the list, deliverance, inheritance, healing, opening barren wounds, finances, daily provision, practical provision. Consider those things and rejoice. Let them build your faith. Number three, testing is going to come. It's going to come to refine us, to purify us. God's with us in the test. Test doesn't last forever. And God brings us out of the test into a place of abundance. And then number four, after all of that, come and hear. Come and hear and tell someone what he's done for you. Let's pray that God will help us get from this place of come and see what he's done for others, but now come and hear what he's done for me. Let me tell you my story. Let me encourage you. And you might be sitting here and you think, well, Julie, that's great. That's, that's a nice encouragement for believers. But I also want to say, if you are here today and you've not accepted Jesus, this message is for you too. You too can have all of these wonderful things that we've talked about. You can have provision, you can have deliverance, you can have healing, and most of all, you can have eternal life with Christ. All you have to do is ask Jesus in your heart. That's it. And all of these things that we've talked about are available to you. Shall we pray today? Can we stand? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the encouragement of your word. We thank you for the strength of your word, God. Lord, let your praises always be in our mouth. God, let your praises come forth joyfully from our mouths, Lord God. Father, we thank you for the wonderful things that are included in your word, these things that encourage us, these stories of what you have done for your people. And we thank you that your hand is still the same today. God, we thank you that you told us in advance that tests and trials were going to come. But God, they're not just... They're not just by chance, but God, you use tests and you use trials to incur, to strengthen us, to refine us, to purify us. God, you walk with us through them. You bring us out of them. And God, we thank you for that. Now, God, we ask that you would make us bold to go and tell our story, to declare what you have done for us. God, we thank you. And Lord, we ask, Lord, if there, if there is anyone who doesn't know you, God, that they would take these words to heart, that they would welcome you into their heart, that they too could walk in this fullness, that they too could walk in this abundance. God, we thank you and we praise your name today, Lord Jesus. May you be glorified in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.